Hi everyone, it's John. Nice to see you again. Um, this week I wanted to show you a few books, sort of break up the monotony of, of constant book reviews back to back. I have over the past several months bought probably more books than I need, certainly more books than I need, <clears throat> and most of them have been from Princeton University Press. The ones I'm going to show you today are from NYRB, the, the NYRB Classics. A few months ago they had a buy at least four books and get 40% off, so I bought seven. And uh, a few of these I'd never heard of, but what I'm going to do is just read you the uh, print matter that they have on their site. Just let you know a bit about each one, and you can let me know if any of these sound interesting. You might be interested in a review. So uh, first up, there is a Primitive Man is Philosopher by Paul Radden. Or, or Raiden, I've, I've never heard his name pronounced. The, uh, the ad matter says, Anthropology is a science whose most significant discoveries have come when it's taken its bearings from literature. And what makes Paul Raiden's Primitive Man as Philosopher a seminal piece of anthropological inquiry is that it is also a book of enduring wonder. Writing in the 1920s, when anthropology was still young, Radden set out to show that primitive cultures are as intellectually sophisticated and venturesome as any of their quote-unquote civilized counterparts. The basic questions about the structure of the natural world, the nature of right and wrong, and the meaning of life and death, as well as basic methods of considering the truth or falsehood of the answers of those questions, give rise to are, Radden argues, recognizably consistent across the whole range of human societies. He rejects both the romantic myth of the noble savage and the rationalist dismissal of the primitive mind as essentially undeveloped, averring that the anthropologist and the anthropologist subject meet on the same philosophical ground, and only when that is acknowledged can anthropology begin in earnest. The argument is clearly and forcibly made in pages that also anthropology can begin, um, excuse me, in the pages that anthropology can contain an extraordinary collection of poems, proverbs, myths, and tales from a host of different cultures, making Primitive Man as Philosopher not only a lasting contribution to the discipline of anthropology, but a unique, rich, and fascinating anthology, one that both illuminates and imagines our imagination of the human. Of course, I had to get that, <clears throat> that uh, nice little advertisement there in the last sentence. But um, I have occasionally reviewed a little bit of anthropology on this channel. Not much. Probably don't read as much as I would like to. But uh, Primitive Man is Philosopher. Up next is Tom at <laughs> uh, um, Tom at LA Books. If you're watching, I think I've mentioned this to you. But this is the first time I'm actually talking about it on my channel. Uh, only going to read that. I'm not reviewing it here. But um, Dante, Poet of the Secular World by Eric Auerbach. You know Eric Auerbach for anything. You probably know him for his huge uh, masterpiece, what most people would call his masterpiece, called Mimesis, which is about the history of Western literature. A series of literary critical essays. Eric Auerbach's Dante, Poet of the Secular World, is an inspiring introduction to one of the world's greatest poets, as well as a brilliantly argued and still provocative essay in the history of ideas. Here, Auer Auerbach, uh, thought by many to be the greatest of the 20th century scholar critics, makes the seemingly paradoxical, paradoxical claim that is, it is in the poetry of Dante, supreme among religious poets, and above all in the stanzas of his Divine Comedy, that the secular world of the modern novel first took imaginative form. Auerbach's study of Dante, a precursor and necessarily co necessary complement to mimesis, his magisterial overview of realism in Western literature, illuminates both the overall structure of the individual detail of Dante's work, 
showing it to be an extraordinary synthesis of the sensuous and the conceptual, the particular and the universal, that redefined notions of human character and fate and opened the way into modernity. Um, so, uh, sort of a history of a of of literature essay. Another one by Arbach. This is a book I had heard mentioned on one or two channels before, but had never previously heard of. This is <clears throat> Reveille in Washington, 1860 to 1865, by Margaret Leach. Uh, it says, 1860, the American capital is sprawling, fractured, squalid, colored by patriotism and treason, and deeply divided along the political lines that will soon embroil the nation in bloody conflict. Chaotic and corrupt, the young city is populated by bellicose congressmen, Confederate conspirators, and enterprising prostitutes. Soldiers of a volunteer army swing from the dome of the Capitol, assassins stalk the, uh, stalk the avenues, and Abraham Lincoln struggles to justify his presidency as the Union heads to war. Reveille in Washington focuses on the everyday politics and preoccupations of Washington during the Civil War. From the stench of corpse-littered streets to the prolonged lace of Mary Lincoln's evening gowns, Margaret Leach illuminates the city and its familiar figures, among them Abraham Lincoln, Jefferson Davis, Robert E. Lee, William Seward, and Mary Surratt in intimate and fascinating that's the third <clears throat> description in a row they've written that uses the word illuminate or illuminating. <laughs> so it's one of their favorite words. Um, so social cultural history of uh, Civil War America, uh, Civil War Washington, D.C., it sounds like. So uh, Next up is a book by one of my uh, favorite historians. The only way I really know her is um, she wrote a, <clears throat> a trilogy of books on the English Revolution, none of which I've read, that are supposed to be amazing. But she also wrote a book on the Irish potato famine back in the 50s, 40s or 50s, that was really superb. And that is... Um, C.V. Wedgwood, and this is her book on the Thirty Years' War, with um, a foreword by Anthony Grafton, who is uh, quite a scholar in his own right. I think it, uh, he's a he's a medievalist and early modernist. I think he's at Princeton, if I'm not mistaken. Europe in 1618 was riven between Protestants and Catholics. Bourbon and Habsburg, as well as empires, kingdoms, and countless principalities. After angry Protestants tossed three representatives of the Holy Roman Empire, Empire out the window of the royal castle in Prague, world war spread from Bohemia with relentless abandon, drawing powers from Spain to Sweden into a nightmare, swirled of famine, disease, and seemingly unstoppable destruction. So, this is uh, this is the Thirty Years' War, um, you know, sixteen eighteen to sixteen forty eight, which um, isn't that the one that ends in the Treaty of Westphalia? I think might have my my wars mixed up, but I think that's the one. Um, so uh, great, great European history from a wonderful historian. Next up is some more liter literary history, uh, Poets in a Landscape, by uh, Gilbert Hyatt, with an introduction by Michael C.J. Putnam. Gilbert Hyatt was a legendary teacher at uh, Columbia University, admired both for his scholarship and his charisma as a lecturer. Poets in a Landscape is his delightful exploration of Latin literature and the Italian landscape. 
As Hyatt writes in his introduction, quote, I have endeavored to recall some of the greatest Roman poets by describing the places where they lived, recreating their characters, and evoking the essence of their work. The poets are Catullus, Virgil, Propertius, Horace, Tibullus, Ovid, and Juvenal. Hyatt brings them life, setting in their historical context, setting them in their historical context, and locating them in the physical world, while also offering crisp modern translations of the poet's finest work. The result is an entirely sui generis amalgam of travel writing, biography, criticism, and pure poetry. Altogether, an unexcelled introduction to the world of the classics. So I I love um, Roman poetry. I can I can read bits and spurts of it in the original Latin, but I also love reading about it, especially when someone smart who has an extensive knowledge of it is um, has something interesting to say. Except some literary criticism by, uh, you know, one of those authors where you may not like their novels, but most people probably like the literary essays and the book reviews, or, or at least more people probably. Um, this is the bad side of books, <laughs> selected essays by D.H. Lawrence, uh, edited with an introduction by Jeff Dyer. You could describe D.H. Lawrence as the great instrumentalist among the great writers of the 20th century. He was a brilliant, endlessly controversial novelist who transformed, for better or worse, the way we write about sex and emotions. He was a wonderful poet. He was an essayist of burning curiosity, expansive lyricism, odd humor, and radical intelligence, equaled perhaps only by Virginia Woolf. Here, Jeff Dyer, one of the finest essayists of our day, draws on the whole range of Lawrence's published essays to reintroduce him to a new generation of readers for whom the essay has become an important genre. We get Lawrence, the book reviewer, writing about death in Venice and welcoming Ernest Hemingway. Lawrence, the travel writer in Mexico and New Mexico and Italy. Lawrence, the memoirist, depicting his strange, sometimes friend, Maurice Magnus. Lawrence, the restless inquirer into the possibilities of the novel, writing about the novel and mortality and addressing the question of why the novel matters. And finally, Lawrence, who meditates on birdsong or the death of a porcupine in the Rocky Mountains. Dyer's selection of Lawrence's essays is a wonderful introduction to a fundamental, dazzling writer. I love large books of essays. Um, this and uh, Elizabeth Hardwick's um, collected essays, which NYRB Classics also did us the great favor of reissuing. Um, really, really good stuff. And <clears throat> finally, a book I was really surprised to find that they um, had published. I had this old ratty copy, um, probably 50 years old, it's a, it was an old pocket book, tiny thing, um, worn. Never read it, but when I saw it, uh, I instantly bought this instead, um, thinking that you know, that old copy was better than nothing, but certainly a, a brand new, fresh, unmarked, clean copy would be much preferable. So I got it. This is the crisis of the European mind is it 16, 1680 to 1715 by Paul Hazard. Hazard. I think, I think he was French, so it might be Hazard. I, yeah, translated from the French. So, um, uh, Paul Hazard's Magisterial, widely influential, and beloved intellectual history offers an unforgettable account of the birth of the modern European mind in all of its dynamic, inquiring, and uncertain glory. Beginning his story 
in the latter half of the 17th century, while also looking back to the Renaissance and forward to the future, Hazard traces the process by which new developments in the sciences, arts, philosophy, and philology came to undermine the stable foundations of the classical world with its commitment to tradition, stability, proportion, and settled usage. Hazard shows how travelers' tales and archaeological investigation widened European awareness and acceptance of cultural difference, how the radical, tra uh, how radical rationalism of Spinoza and Richard Simon's new historical exegesis of the Bible called into question the revealed truths of religion, how the Huguenot Pierre Bale's critical dictionary of ideas paved the way for Voltaire and the Enlightenment, even as the empiricism of Locke encouraged a new attention to sensory experience that led to Rousseau and Romanticism. Hazard's range of knowledge is vast, and whether the subject is operas, excavations, or scientific experiments, his brilliant style and powers of description bring to life the thinkers who thought up the modern world. So, intellectual history, that is, of course, some of my favorite stuff to read. So um, those are the seven books that I got from NYRB a few months ago. Like I said, over the next few months, I don't want to post them all at once. I figured that would be maybe a little boring or, I don't know, overwhelming. You know, the, the stuff that I show sometimes, it's a little bit nerdy. Um, I didn't want to do it all at once. So I'll probably show 10 or 12 books at a time um, and spread it out, like I said. Um, from now through the summer or so. And uh, hopefully in the next three or four months won't accrue another 50 books to show you. So the point is to actually catch up sometime and to come to a point where I no longer have any books to show you. Um, so we'll see how that goes. A couple of more reviews after this, and then we will start with our, I would say probably 50 book or so, Princeton University Press uh, books. So until then, I will see you next week.